In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The land on which United Lutheran Seminary sits, and that stretches between its two campuses, is tribal land. Inhabited originally by the Lenai Lenape, the Susquehannock, and the Seneca tribes. We honor those original caretakers of this land, and we pay respect to the original inhabitants of what we now call Pennsylvania. Acknowledging this history is consistent with the seminary's commitment to welcome and equity, which calls us in Christ to repentance, reconciliation, and wholeness. Even though the sad history of colonization cannot be undone, this land acknowledgement is one small way for us to remember what happened here, to understand our part in the story, and to develop a more healthy relationship with the land and its original inhabitants. Let us pray. We give you thanks, O God, for all of life and for our common calling as your servants, for the work of your church, and for the ministries of word and sacrament and service. We give you thanks for all whom you call to be leaders in your church and for the teaching teachers who form them for service through the witness and mission of our seminaries. May the church join courageously in your work of compassion, mercy, justice, and peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Please be seated. By action of the Board of Trustees, taken on the eighth day of June in the year of our Lord, 2020, Robert Guy Irwin was elected to fill the Ministerium of Pennsylvania Chair of Reformation Studies. The Ministerium of Pennsylvania Chair is one of the oldest chairs in the history of United Lutheran Seminary, being endowed already in 1864. During the past century and a half, this chair has been held by distinguished teachers pastors, scholars, all of whom have contributed to the life of the church in distinctive ways. At this time, we honor the memory and legacy of Professor Mann, Professor Speth, Professor Schmauk, Professor Horn, Professor Fisher, Professor Seegers, Professor Nolde, and Professor Ruman. We also celebrate and thank God for the witness and scholarship of the Reverend Tim Wengert, the Ministerial Ministerium of Pennsylvania Emeritus Chair of Reformation Studies. And it is to this distinguished company that we welcome the Reverend Dr. Robert Guy Irwin at this time. Dr. Irwin, please stand. Dear sibling in Christ, as a professor in this seminary, you subscribed to its doctrinal basis as stated in its constitution 
at this further milestone, do you reaffirm that subscription? As a professor, you promise to take part in fulfilling the purposes of the seminary and to exemplify what you teach through a life which is a testimony to the gospel of Christ and the gift of the Spirit. Will you continue to accept these duties as your own and do you promise to discharge them to the best of your ability? Please face the congregation and at this time I invite my faculty colleagues, former faculty, adjunct faculty and emeriti faculty to join Dr. Irwin around the chair. With the authority of the Board of Trustees, I declare you, Dr. Guy Irwin, the Ministerium of Pennsylvania Chair of Reformation Studies in the United Lutheran Seminary. Congratulations. <laughs> Almighty God, bless us, defend us from all evil, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Amen. I am terrifically grateful to all of you for being here. By being here, you show not only your love for the seminary, but also I enjoy your respect for me. I thought before I started the lecture I have to say a little bit about the ceremonial garb that I am wearing and the blankets that you saw, both the one put around me and the ones on the side. I'm a member of the Osage Nation of Oklahoma and one of the characteristics of our uh, visual culture are blankets and ribbon work in particular. So the pattern of Osage blankets always has a multicolored border. Some blankets have a handprint symbol on them, which is a sign of friendship and peace. The ribbon shirt I'm wearing is typical for, tri for tribes of the American Plains and doesn't have anything distinctive about it in itself, except that this one was made for me. I'm wearing a pectoral cross made for, by a member of the Navajo tribe of Arizona and a beaded version of Luther's Rose that was made for me by my sister, Amity. So it is 100% native product. It's important to me to be able to be here in this because I come to you not only with what I know and 
what I have done and what I hope to do, but also with who I am in my various kinds of identity. This is the one that gets noticed the least, and so I wanted to lift it up a little bit today. I hope that you will forgive me the vague and somewhat generic title that I put on this lecture for its advertising. And first, when I first came up with it, it was actually intentionally vague because I knew I needed a topic that would be connected to my vocation as a scholar and a teacher, and one that connected meaningfully to the mission of the institution that I've been called to lead, the call that we're celebrating today. But to be honest with you, I needed a placeholder a couple of months ago while I collected my thoughts. But later, as I thought about it more, it seemed to me that this very vague and somewhat circular question might actually be more helpful to my thinking than I had originally thought. And it changed for me into a whole sequence of new questions, theological questions, about how we can presume to teach about a faith that none of us can fully describe, or through teaching, inspire faith in a God none of us can fully know. How can we inspire our students, how can we equip our students to inspire faith in others if, in fact, that inspiration must come from the Holy Spirit, a force we cannot channel or control? And more broadly, how can we, in this complicated moment in our own history as a seminary and as a nation, hope to cooperate in God's desire for our collective future? when we can only see so dimly what lies ahead. To get more specific, how do we relate what we call faith, our inward response to the nudging of the Holy Spirit through which we come to trust in God through Jesus Christ, how do we connect this to what we have learned, more or less abstract, learned about God and about Jesus from others, learned through reading and study and teaching? In other words, what role does the Spirit play in our teaching and our learning? What is the relationship between faith and knowledge for us right now? Then following on that, I would ask how we relate this blend of faith and understanding in and about God and about Jesus that comes from within us but then is also shaped by others. How can we relate this to the way we live our lives active in the world? lives lived in real time, in personal agency, in relationship with our neighbors, both the neighbors who share our faith or something like it in that community we call church, and those in the wider world around us who do not share our faith at all. In other words, what is the relationship between our faith and our life in the world? This is, of course, at, at its base, the challenge of every single Christian to believe and to live, to have faith and to live faithfully. Those whom seminaries like this one try to prepare to be leaders in communities of people who are facing this challenge together, not only have to answer those questions for themselves, but to steer and guide and encourage others to engage in the challenge themselves. Not only that, but such leaders don't simply figure these things out once and for all to neatly present onward to their flocks, but precisely because of the thoughtfulness and depth of the deliberation their seminary study required, actually will be required to rethink and retest their assumptions and their knowledge again and again. As their life experience raises new uncertainties and their people ask them the hard questions, that are part of every human life. Those of you who have had careers in ministry already will know exactly what I mean. It would be nice if we could teach theology or history or preaching in such a way that a person could take away from here a neat set of unchanging certainties with many practical applications. In more optimistic times, we actually tried to do just that. Both our predecessor seminaries were, in slightly different ways, founded to send out young white males to defend their denominational theology 
in the competitive world of other American Christians, communities mostly led by others much like them. But we don't do this anymore. We recognize that the ultimate questions are ultimately unanswerable, and the world outside us is immeasurably complex. So instead, we hope to foster in our students humility and patience and the strength to lead even in uncertainty and ambiguity in an anxious world that would prefer simple, clear answers and tangible outcomes and more people in the pews. Everyone who wrestles today with the question of what the future holds for theological education is aware of two great realities. One, that intrinsically, inseparably linked to our mission to create leaders for the church, seminaries are bound together with the churches we serve, and we must change and adapt as they are changing. And second, though the bond is not as tight, we are also part of a wider system of American higher education, degree-granting, accredited, intrinsically part of the great national network of professional schools accountable to standards of quality and practice that go beyond theology alone. The first of those realities is primary. Historically, this seminary and every seminary was founded for and by the church. The second reality came more gradually, as both ministry and academy became more professionalized and embedded in an American civic culture. And of course, both the church, the churches, as this cuts across all the traditions, and the academy, higher education broadly conceived, are both facing crises right now. Crises that have been a long time in the making, but which have made much more acute right now by the now more than 18 months that the coronavirus pandemic has held us in its grip. We still don't know how, or in fact, even if this pandemic will end, but it will have changed us in some permanent ways. We are entering into a time of intensified sifting and sorting, one that threatens to leave few aspects of our seminary life untouched. The trends are sobering, sobering to say the least. Maintaining educational institutions like ours will not become easier in the years ahead. In spite of all this, at ULS and the other seminaries, we still dare to teach. And we invite students to learn. And we work with our churches to prepare for professional leaders. And we try our best to do all this within the expectations and conventions of American higher education. This is the promise we have made to the institutions to which we are directly accountable and which we are linked. It remains to us, however, to understand and interpret what we are doing as a seminary in the light of how God and the Spirit are working in our midst and in our day. This is where the theological will always be a corrective to the merely institutional part of our mission, because it is, I believe, a call to ongoing reform. In its mission statement, United Lutheran Seminary makes the claim that its goal is to be equipping people to proclaim the living gospel for a changing church and world. Though a worthy goal indeed, and a natural one, this is far from unique, and it begs for greater clarity about the object, the people, the task, proclaiming a living gospel, and the context of a changing church and world. Though I was just a new board member at ULS at his very first meeting, I was in the room and participated in the exercise in which this mission statement sentence was hammered out. And I can tell you that these were words around which the consensus gathered quickly. And they sounded comforting in the moment, precisely because they were familiar and easy to say. They reflected our sense of what we have always done, and they promised to keep us on a path familiar to both predecessor seminary communities, hopeful for continuity in spite of turmoil. 
To proclaim the living gospel for a changing church and world is far more complex and audacious a goal, though, than I first thought that day that we adopted it. And it raises two important theological questions I've already mentioned. What does it mean here and now to teach the faith we are called to proclaim? And how do we engage with the world, with our context here and now, in a country torn apart by a sharp clash of cultures, of deep systemic racism, and long unresolved questions about truth, equity, and justice? It is audacious to think that our school and our professors and students and staff being engaged together in such a bold enterprise to prepare and send leaders forth to bring Christ again into the midst of a world of pain and confusion and division. It seems audacious, but this is what we do. We use words like living gospel and changing church as though they were just ordinary things, when behind them is power, the power of life and death. God's destroying and creative power manifest in us and all around us. We, when we do theological education, are literally playing with fire here. With the power of the prophets, with the flames of Pentecost. And this power is infused through everything we do and in every part of our work together. Let me go back quickly to my three original questions. How can we teach what we ourselves cannot fully know? How can we teach a word of truth that must ultimately come from God? How can we, both as teachers and learners, be part of what God intends for our society and the world? Each of these questions approached humbly and collectively can help us with some useful ways of organizing our thinking about theological education. How can we teach what we cannot fully know? This, of course, is a foundational question for all of theology, which answers it by focusing on the things that can be known and the traces of God in human history and experience. Of course, for Christians, this centers on the scriptures, but it includes history and that mode of thinking we call theology. Many of the people in this room, and I include myself, have made a life's work of looking at those traces and giving them meaning. But within that broad answer, for me, the better answer has become this. To teach less propositionally and more relationally. Not about ideas as things in themselves, but as testimony and witness to human experience. Let me use a little testimony to illustrate this point. I was trained by great teachers. Great teachers in great universities to teach the history of Christianity and Christian thought in a very traditional way. I was taught by masters of the craft whose knowledge was encyclopedic and whose grasp of the material seemed endlessly broad. I wanted to know what they knew, and I wanted to be able to tell the story as they told it. It was a story, of course, primarily of ideas, how the concept of God had shaped human society and the way humans lived, how out of the life and death of Jesus and the work of the apostles, a small, despised, and countercultural faith became the defining and organizing shape of a great European empire, an all encompassing culture, and a brilliant, ever evolving, complex system of thought. And then for me, especially important, was how that culture and that, those complex ways of thinking over every time and every age both resisted change and adapted to it, giving what we sometimes casually call the history of Christian thought an incredibly rich and varied content. This is one of the rooms where people will know what I say when I say that I cut my teeth on Adolf von Harnack and Reinhold Seberg, 
and the whole 19th century enterprise of historical theology. Even as at the end of his career, my own dissertation advisor was writing his own five volume history of Christian theology in much the same vein as all the teachers before him. My education in theology and history was tremendously exciting and stimulating and a wonderful experience. I thought I was learning literally everything that was most important in the Christian story. But of course I wasn't. I only had a slice of a much larger story. A story that wasn't just scholarly or German or Protestant or European or even Christian in the way that those lenses had both sharpened and narrowed my focus on what I thought Christianity was about. I had mistaken the great depth of my field for breadth. And at looking at, scholar, at questions that scholars had debated over and over again, I had just failed to question the relevance of the questions to a whole world of human experience that lay outside them. Experience by people not European, not white, not even Christian within the boundaries that my mind had drawn. I have not lost interest in all those things I learned back then, but in my maturity I have grown to love the mystery of all the things I do not know and perhaps will never know about all the Christian stories that there are to tell. Though I have not been an active teacher of, of university or seminary courses now for almost a decade, even in the 25 years of my teaching career before that, I changed both my teaching methods and my content very radically away from the authorities I had learned and my own interpretation of them to a more bottom-up approach based on the stories of an experienced Christianity witnessed in the accounts and stories of believers. This was much harder to do because the material is much less even and much less plentiful now, but it made it possible, even within the narrow bounds of European Christian history, for me to open up to the voices of women, the poor, and those marginalized by the structures of power, race, sexuality, and gender. It wasn't easy, but once I started, I found it so natural. Because as I rediscovered, I was ultimately, I was ultimately far more interested in people than in abstract ideas anyway. And that when I learned to look not just at what people said they believed, but how it shaped their lives and relationships, I could find new relevance even in old material. So how does this address the question of how we teach about a God we can never fully know? I think it reorients us back to texts and contexts. Scripture, the lived reality of Christians, and the intersection between faith, motivation, and life. We can be modest about what we can say with certainty about God and still be ambitious to see how faith has shaped human life. This is an ambition best satisfied by diversity in approaches and experiences. And also, in my maturity, I have come to see parts of my life, especially my Osage heritage, as part of a witness and testimony to the impact of Christianity on a non-European colonized people. Even though it's nothing I have ever formally taught about, it's a story that has shaped my life. And of course, for the most part, it's not a happy story. But that is not the point. We learn from all the stories, even the stories of trauma and loss, and can wonder at how what Christians believe has sometimes destroyed and sometimes liberated the people they touched. How can we teach what ultimately must be learned from God? Can Christian leadership even be taught? We know that students come to us with extremely varied gifts, moved by very different impulses toward public ministry, and shaped by unique life experiences. Some find what we offer them in seminaries like this opens them up to new and richer understanding of a faith that they brought with them. Others find it a rocky path on which the faith that had long comforted them is challenged. 
sometimes profoundly. It's almost a joke that people go to seminary to have their faith dismantled. And some people can't handle that. And I understand that. Sometimes I think we are far too impatient with those who are wrestling with having to rewrite their whole stories of God. And there is real pain and loss involved in having certainties replaced by questions. Maybe even especially those certainties that we, their teachers, really, to be honest, think they are better off without. Even those leave a void behind and represent a loss that sometimes just must be mourned. Here again, as in the first question, I think our best approaches are relational and not abstract. As teachers, we are prepared to be experts, and this is the role our students most often want us to play. What's the question? And what's the right answer? Sometimes the impatience with open-endedness, with imprecision and ambiguity, tempts us to short-circuit a, a process that is as important as its outcome, which is the collective reflection on basic questions of faith lived and experienced in community. I tend to believe that teachers teach as much by how they teach as by what they teach by the kind of attentive curiosity they apply both to the subject matter and to the students in their class. This is in the interplay between the material and those engaged in it that the learning really happens. The figurative light bulb that goes off is not the insight that's won at the end of the wrestling. It's the energy created by focusing in the same way at the same time on a question together. But this is hard and slow. And not everyone can be focused the same way at the same time, especially with online teaching and Zoom and all the devices we love but that distract us all the time. Here, too, seminary faculty are key. For by modeling what it means to be receptive learners, with our own students and from we can create a learning experience that allows both for the expansion of our own minds and greater openness in our own hearts. We can work at what it means to be community in both teaching and learning and for this we need to know one another better and see each other in our complexity and intersectionality. As I said before I'm wearing my ribbon shirt today because a colleague gently reminded me earlier this week that I teach not only by what I say, but the mere fact of who I am. And even in that, we all have something to offer each other. It is my strong hope that ULS and all seminaries will try to engage in theological education that is increasingly contextual, not just in its subject matter, but even in the way it's delivered. And I can tell you, as one who, as a bishop, face the challenge of trying to find candidates for congregations to call as pastors, I can promise you that the real experience of congregational life, and not just in one congregation, but in more than one, is crucial to the success of such a call. I hope that we will all continue to learn our whole lives long, but it's those first few years of congregational life when a call to ministry is most severely tested. And faithfulness, compassion, and resilience are honestly more important for our students than any single point of academic content. This is hard to teach, but it can be cultivated. And I believe that we must put greater emphasis on contextual education as real education and not just as an extracurricular experience. It's also a way for our students to experience difference, and though it is a challenge to cross cultural lines, we are not preparing our students to be living in a bubble or in a church that doesn't yet exist, but in the messy, complicated community that it is that requires constant negotiation and renegotiation. How can we be a part of God's work in the world? without a roadmap for the future. Seminaries, whether they are narrowly denominational the way ours used to be, 
or more generally ecumenical, as we try to be now, are still intrinsically connected to churches. Our fate is to a significant degree tied up with them. This might, when one looks particularly at mainline denominations, be a pretty scary reality. But even beyond those churches that are doing the demographic studies and worrying about their futures, the future doesn't really look rosy in the United States for institutional Christianity at all. We are not part of a growing community, and we are surrounded by reminders of times in which our market share was greater. What at the time of their creation were glorious sanctuaries expressing their builders' love and faithfulness and confidence have now become leaky, expensive burdens for their latter-day descendants who must heat and maintain them. The explosive optimism of American Christianity in the early 20th century is largely gone. Instead, we have a remnant. The church has moved to the margins. At least its most dramatic growth is among the migrant community who seek community and stability in their new home and who see church as a way of connecting. Ironically, for most of the history of Lutheranism in America, that was our story too. Successive waves of immigration from Europe kept our church growing and expanding and offering care to new people as they assimilated into American life. But that tap has been turned off and the mission of Americanization has been completed for European Lutherans of the past. But somehow we still miss that feeling of growth. It is in this question of how we best cooperate in God's work right now that I see remarkable energy in many of our churches and also even in our ELCA. Three areas in particular are places I think we can see God's hand. The growing willingness, willingness and even desire in largely white churches to confront issues of race and white privilege, the venerable but renewed now Christian critique of capitalism, wealth, and economic injustice, and of course not least, concern for the earth and for the care of creation. All of these are more than American issues, but the North American church has particular work to do in all of them, and especially in the area of race. The seminary, in my view, has a large role to play in this as well. It is my firm conviction that until Americans, and particularly white Americans, can join in a consensus understanding of the realities of American history and the injustice and cruelty on which the nation was built and became wealthy and powerful, until we can reach that consensus understanding, we will be unable to come to anything like grappling with what it means to be the heirs to that history. Obviously, as a historian, I'm biased about this, but I think the study of his history is key. And to be honest, I think, looking back on it now, that one of the reasons I became a European historian was that I was unsettled by the challenge American history presents us. No one, no European, certainly, could look at 20th century European history and fail to see it as disastrous and disturbing. Yet all my life, what passed for American history was a story of upward striving, the successful assimilation of immigrants, and an increasing role on the world stage that was justified by American wealth and American civic virtue. Even the deep story of my own family, natives and settlers alike, told me that this was more mythic than real. But the crushing weight of white American self-justification was a greater burden even on me than I had consciously understood. That is something no white seminarian should leave ULS without having wrestled with. The overwhelming and pervasive advantage shown to white English-speaking Americans over those who are African-American, Asian, Native, or non-English-speaking. Those of South and Central American origin bring a special challenge, both of race and language, but it is the crushing 
multi-generational experience of the African-American community and the erasure of the native presence that should trouble us most deeply. Recognizing this reality must be something we all do every day. And I think the church can help. This too is God's work, and we must participate in it to learn anew what it means to be human community. We can't see the future, but we can see where our duty lies right now, which is to encounter each other as best we can with charity and hope. We will inevitably hurt each other as we go along, but if we are humble and willing to listen, some of the hurt may bring growth. We've made great progress on questions of sexuality and gender, and although these are not something we can ever stop working on, at least having LGBTQIA people prominently featured in every part of our life, from students to faculty to seminary presidents to bishops, this will help move the needle on that as well. We can't always or maybe ever see where God is leading us, where God is using us for good, but I think that we can know that every uncomfortable conversation that teaches us something new, every awkward encounter that in the end brings greater familiarity and less fear, every one of these is a good and holy thing. And maybe we here who are going deeper, understanding our lives theologically, even as we teach and study and live together in community, Perhaps we pilgrims on the way can experience together with God's help a kind of conversion, an opening of our eyes to see more clearly the truth and beauty that we should see reflected in each other's faces and the shining glory of God shown in creation. Perhaps we, too, here at United Lutheran Seminary can bear the light of Christ and let it light our way through all our fear. It is a great and awesome thing to speak for God to God's people. But we are called by Jesus to witness what God has done for us all through Christ. We are fed and shaped by the Spirit and called by the church to work for the sake of the world and the good of all. May that be our mission here in this seminary as well. Amen. It is so great to have you all in this room. Now I'll call on Pastor Leonard for our closing prayer. We turn our hearts and minds over to, uh, to prayer at this time. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God of wisdom, in your goodness you provide faithful teachers for your church. By your Holy Spirit, you have called Guy to the ministry of witness and service in teaching. Give him and all faculty members of United Lutheran Seminary insight into your word, holy lives as examples to us all and the courage to know and to do the truth in every circumstance. To your son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, and the people of God said, Amen. Amen.
We will reconvene at 5.30 in this space for the inaugural concert celebration. So uh, stand up, stretch, but don't go too far.
this the Dr. Irwin's? Are you all? Um, yeah, we got to get them hymnals now for um, ELW hymnals for lift up for the choir. Sing. Yeah. Okay. I will have um, Yvonne. I was Yvonne looking for him. Okay. You want to take Dr. Uh, Irwin's folder? Oh yeah. Um, do you have your reading? Huh? Are you going to bring your reading no, up no, with I'm, you? I'm, or I'm did you? Right there. Huh? I'm standing down here. Now you have to come up here. It's being taped. Well, she told me that I'm mic'd. Uh, oh, you're mic'd. Uh -huh. I invite everyone to take a seat and we can begin the next part of our evening, the inaugural concert celebration. Our story Our story has been told. We are the Fon, the Ibu, the Ibo, the Hausa, the Ashante, the Mandinka, the Ewe, the Tiv, and the Ga. We are the Fante, the Fulani, the Ija, the Mende, the Wolof the Yoruba, the Bakongo, and the Mbutu. And we are proud. 
We know our ancestors by name. We did not know we would not return. We could not understand why the lesson, this lesson, had come to us. So we simply believed that some terrible calamity had befallen us because we had strayed from the favor of the one true God. Yet by faith, we determined to survive it. We are the diaspora daughters and the sanctified sons of the Ethiopian who found Jesus along the roadside. We are the distinct and sane people who speak many, many separate tongues, although from the same land. And so, in the distinct and newly imagined embodied rhythms of chains and shackles pounded against planks upon which we lay, we hear and understand God. God's deliverance is as one people. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and there we wept when we remembered Zion. We put away our harps, hanging them on the branches of poplar trees. For there by the river, our captors demanded a song, a joyful hymn from us, saying, let's hear you sing one of them songs y'all sing in Jerusalem. Uh, but how could we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? And how can we forget Mother Africa? How can we forget Jerusalem, our greatest joy? The secret of our drums reverberates in our souls. We sing songs of our ancestors so that our children shall know from whom they come. We call Spirit God by a different name, but now our God has come for such times as these. We are a changed people, roots of the same tree. How can we not sing? Good evening and good even tide. Good evening. Good evening. It is my honor and privilege to welcome you, our special guests, friends, and family at the United Lutheran Seminary to the concert of praise and blessing, honoring the Reverend Dr. R. Guy Irwin on the occasion of his inauguration as president of our seminary. The Urban Theological Institute of United Lutheran Seminary presents this concert as a worship offering to God, reflecting the history of the black church and the African American worship experience. We pray that this offering will edify your spirit and be a sweet and holy fragrance to God. And so we gather. The program will proceed as printed. Amen. Amen. I want to make sure, can you hear me? Yes. We're going to just start this evening off with giving me a clean heart. Give me a clean heart so I may serve thee. Lord, fix my heart so that I may be you by you for Lord I'm not worthy of all these blessings give me a clean heart and I'll follow thee the scripture reading is from Psalm 51 verse 10 it's Psalm 51 verse 10 and it reads thusly, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain in me a willing spirit, and I will teach transgressions your ways, and sinners will return to you. This is the hour this is the day this is the time god is the spirit and those who worship god must worship in spirit and in truth 
the Messiah is come to proclaim all things to us. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, God Almighty, eternal God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the presence of your spirit. And we ask you, Lord, as we know your spirit is here, but for every person here, every family represented, allow that spirit, Lord, to just consume them, Lord, in your presence. We thank you for this day and the celebration of all, Lord, are singing the praises to you on this day and every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. amen and amen. amen.
Sí. From Vicar Diane Lewis from Gettysburg. Moment. And the scripture was Isaiah 55, from the 55th chapter of Isaiah. Incline your ear and come to me, listen so that you may live. I will make with you an everlasting covenant, a witness to the peoples, a leader and commander for the peoples. See, you shall call in nations that you do not know, shall run to you because of the Lord your God the Holy One of Israel, for he has glorified you. From Colossians, the first chapter, 9 through 12, for this reason, since the day we heard it, Dr. Irwin, we have not ceased praying for you and asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of God, with, with all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so that, you, so that you may lead a life worthy of the Lord, continue to lead a life worthy of the Lord fully, pleasing to him as you hear fruit in every good work, and as you grow in the knowledge of God. May you be made among, made strong with all the strength that comes from his glorious power. And may you be prepared to endure everything with patience while joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has enabled you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the light. Let us pray. Gracious Father, Mother God, we thank you for one who comes, who thinks it's not robbery to take the mantle of leadership. God, we thank you for, for for leader. God, we don't have words to tell you how grateful we are at this moment, at this time, that he has accepted your mantle as well as the mantle of humankind to, to, uh, to this appointed task. And now, God, we ask that you bless him from the top of his head to the soles of his feet. All that is within him, God. We know that there, that there, will not, there will be good times and there will be bad times, but we pray, God, that you're covering, you will cover him, knowing that he is your son, your child. And now, God, in the affirmation of those presents, we ask all these things in the matchless name of Christ the Savior, and the people who agree will say joyously, Amen, 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 amen and Amen. amen. It was. 
Yes, and we thank the choir because we hear you and we feel you. Can you feel them? That's what I'm talking about. And it's because of that foundation, and scripture tells us about the cornerstone of our foundation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The builder of a house has more honor than the house itself, for every house is built by someone. But the builder of all things is God. Amen? Amen? So I want to read to you about heritage because at this portion you'll see that we're talking about, hush, somebody's calling my name. We are remembering those who have come before us. Amen? And this is written by our sister here, Reverend Williams, to our ancestors working on a building, the true foundation. Can you hear them praying? Can you hear them singing, working on a building? Lifting up the blood-stained banner for the Lord, servants marching, heaven-bound, claiming their reward. I'm working on a building. It's a true foundation. Can you hear me praying? Can you hear me singing? Steal away home, still holding up the banner for Christ cornerstone. 
Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Yes, we come to you, Lord, praying to you, Father God. Lord, we come to you because we know you are the only one. We are remembering right now that we are among a cloud of witnesses, Father God. We know that there are those in heaven, those ancestors who have come before us, those who have gone through the stony path, those who have cried and had tears on slaughtered roadways, those, Father God, who have borne the brunt, and Lord, what they had was a faith in you. We come to you remembering, Lord, because lest we forget, it repeats again. We come to you, Lord, because we know that it is through your Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, that we find the foundation that will uphold us. And on this special day, in this season, Lord, where we're hopeful and we are renewing and we have faith in this inauguration, where we have faith in our new leadership and our president, God, we are remembering all that has come before us and we lift up your name, we lift up our voices and we sing and we rejoice. And in all these things we do, Lord, out of love for you, because we know that you are our true foundation. Amen, amen, amen.
Hallelujah. 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 Hosanna. That is the highest praise. Can we get an amen? amen? Thank you, choir. Hallelujah. I rise this evening to talk about community unity. I am so thankful, so humbled, and so blessed that we have such a wonderful and illustrious president who is flexible and in his wisdom and in his compassion and humility, he opens the door for seminary students, the leaders, the teachers, for all of us to go outside the four walls to serve in this present age, to learn the word of God, to be internally based and externally relevant. Can we get an amen? <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you. Uh, my first reading is from Psalm 133. How very good and pleasant it is where kindred live together in unity. I'm a walker, y'all. Forgive me. <laughs> it is like the precious oil of the head running down upon the beard and on the beard of Aaron, running down over the collar of his robe. It is like the dew of Hermon which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord ordained his blessing, life forevermore. I am so thankful for this reading. And we have an excerpt here that was also written by uh, Dr. Williams, Professor Williams, thank you, Lord. <laughs> we sing sweet notes and blue notes, arias and anthems, hip hop and hymns gospel, jazz, and blues. There is no strict lines of demarcation separating our musical genre. There just isn't one. Come on, here in the black church. Songs of weariness, songs of joy, songs of passion, songs of inspiration, and songs of hope. We sing. We sing of an ever-present hope that we have in Christ Jesus. A hope that justice will roll down like the waters and righteousness like an everlasting stream. Woo! Thank you, Jesus. Let us pray. Most gracious, everlasting, and eternal God, our Father. Lord, we thank you, O oh God, for the spirit of unity and the bond of peace that exists here on tonight. God, we thank you, Lord, for our illustrious leader, O oh God, that you will continue to cover him and bless him. Lord, build him up so that he can lead us. Oh God, we thank you now for the leaders, for the teachers, for the professors. God, that they are empowering us, giving us tools, equipping us so that we can go out and serve in this present age, God, knowing to rightly divide the word of truth. Oh God, we thank you. Lord, we bless and praise you for each and every one of us, oh God, that we would be empowered again, oh God, and give us the tools, God, to go out, Lord, and to walk in, in power, the resurrection power, oh God, to complete the mandate that you have given us. Oh God, that we can go, Lord, to the least of these, but then also, God, that we can also take the next step, God, to confront the social injustices, oh God, that has our people so bound. In the name of Jesus, oh God, we thank you and we bless you and we praise you. We give you all the glory, all the honor, and all the praise because it belongs to you. Amen. Amen.
had some good days I've had some hills to climb I've had some weary days And some sleepless nights But when I look around and I think things over all of my good days they outweigh my weary days oh I won't Sometimes my clouds hang low I can hardly see the road I ask the question, Lord Why is this so much? That's why I want to say hey, thank you, Lord. Mm -hmm. I want to say hey, thank you, Lord. I want to say thank you, Lord. I won't, I won't complain.
say that many of us in the room today know Richard Smallwood's total praise. The joke about that song is that everybody or every church that knows it knows it a little different way. And usually it ain't the way Richard wrote it, but they could all mix together one way or another. So I'm gonna ask my friend and colleague, Diane Dixon, to come and conduct total praise. And everyone can feel free to sing. The way you know it, as long as your notes fit in the chord.
of us in the African American church experience knows when a song is sung like that and we are next on the mic, it's just to wait. <laughs> this is the Lord's doing. And it is marvelous in our eyes to presiding Bishop Eaton, to all the other bishops present, both here in the chapel and virtually, to all the clergy that are present, to all of our guests, our students, alumni, faculty, and staff, members of Utica, which is UTI's Committee of Advisors, and our chair, the Reverend Albert Johnson and to our president, the Reverend Dr. R. Guy Irwin. Very quickly, I'm always in this precarious position of always standing between food <laughs> and closing remarks. However, I do want to commend the students who are sitting in front of me, and we have students elsewhere, but let me just highlight these four who have participated and the one virtually. Um, Dr. Clifford Stanley, retired general in the Marines, who I always like to brag about, Dr. Stanley, I said, who has his own Wikipedia page, but felt called to come to seminar. I won't give his age away, but he is, he's met his three score in 10. And, to, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And Minister Ravana Reynolds, who was a certificate student with us, who is now a degree student, and these two serve as our student representatives on the Utica board. Diane Lewis, who you saw on the screen but could not hear, is president of our student government. And Robin Hinton, to my left, is vice president of our student government. Thank you. All of them in the black church concentration. But I want to highlight two persons. What you have seen before you, I cannot take credit for because the creator, designer, and worship leader who has put all of this together for us this evening is the Reverend Marcia Williams. Thank you, Marcia. And when I came here to Philadelphia, she was already a gem of the seminary. I just kept her. Mrs. Sheila Booker. Thank you. Sheila Booker is the director of the Sounds of Joy Ensemble, which you see behind us. Just a sample of them, not all of them. And Diane Lewis, who sang, thank you. Diane, you always bless us when you take the mic. And then the Reverend Richard Norris on the piano and the sounds of the 57th Street Band. By the way, Sheila Marcia and I hope that they, they are AMEs, by the way. That's just the AME clan is in the house. Dr. Irwin, on behalf of the Urban Theological Institute of United Lutheran Seminary, we pray for your success as president of our seminary. As we think of leadership, we know that every leader needs to be lifted in prayer and encouragement. So the Urban Theological Institute promises to lift your hands as Aaron and her held up the hands of Moses as read in Exodus 17, in prayer and encouragement. As that story unfolds, we read, where the Lord says to Moses, write this as a reminder in a book and recite it in the hearing of Joshua. And Moses built an altar, altar and he called it, the Lord, my banner. Allow me to merge the leadership of Moses and Joshua with these words to you, President Irwin, as you represent 
both our past and our future. You are leading United Lutheran Seminary, who in 1826 was one seminary. In 1864 became two. And in 2017, united and became one again. And therefore, I leave you with these words from Joshua 1. Be strong and courageous, for the Lord your God is with you. Amen. Allow me to invite our president to have some closing remarks, and I will remain on the platform to close out by introducing our last hymn, Thus Why You See Hymnals in Your Pews. I know you was wondering, why am I holding this hymn? I have not. You will sing in a minute. Let's receive President Irwin. Yes, Thank you, Dr. Q. Surely the Spirit of God is in this place. My heart is full with gratitude to these wonderful people who have put together this hour of praise, to our musicians. How nice it is to have you with us. How wonderful it is to lift our voices again in the same space where we can hear and see each other and sing the praise of our God. At United Lutheran Seminary, the Urban Theological Institute is our pearl of great price. It enlivens our lives, our study, our understanding of our faith in every way and all the time. I have come to understand in the year that I have been here how profound its impact has been in this community and at this seminary and I hope that that impact continues and increases over time. I'm so proud of all of you, so grateful that you have been so kind to me and that you have taken me into your midst and embraced me with your prayers and with your support. In my tribal tradition, when we want to refer to all those people we belong to, we say, all my relatives, because in a way we are all related. And I'd like to say that to all of you, too, and to everyone in the room, that we who are all children of the God, we adore our kin to one another. And so I'll leave you with that, with deep gratitude and thanks. There will be many occasions to be together in the future, and I can say a lot more, but I'll stop there. Again, as Dr. Q said, there is supper waiting for us. But I'm going to ask if I can can tread on his turf for just a second and ask every Lutheran in this room to repeat after me, 841, 841. Never forget that number. You might know the number of a mighty fortress in the hymnal. This is the number of the hymn we're about to sing. Before we sing our closing song, I just want to um, add um, credentials. I am a proud um, graduate of the first certificate class in UTI in church leadership. My husband was a very proud graduate, got his MDiv here back in 2003 or something like that. And I always like to tell people here the line he said. He said, I worked so many years part-time trying to get that MDiv, and all they gave me was a piece of paper. <laughs> they keep calling you back to do stuff. <laughs> so, but I just want to say, thank, thank, thank Sounds of, Sounds of Joy personally. This is about two-thirds of Sounds of Joy, which already has, this choir has quite a history already with the seminary. And, yeah. You're just maintaining it. They come back several times every year to do something with you. And also, Richard Norris has been introduced. But over back there in the corner on guitar is Steve Clark. Stephen Clark. Yes. 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 Taylor Richardson. Yes. 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 And the soloist 
Swift Sound of 57th Street was Diane Dixon. And I want to make the point that Reverend Richard Norris at the piano is also pastor of Bethel AME Church in Pensacola, New Jersey. So don't go too far. We close with lift every voice and sing. The song of the black church is a prayer of thanksgiving for faithfulness and freedom, a testimony of reverence and gratitude for the faith journey of African American people. It remembers the selfless sacrifice of the ancestors in the face of invincible odds, celebrates our deep history, and speaks to the universal human condition. Let us all stand now and sing, lift every voice and sing. We'll be led or directed by Sheila Booker.
Let us not tarry. If you have RSVP, please make your way to Brosman Center.